Whenever I oversleep and find myself running late for work, I find myself in a bit of a crisis. A time crisis, that is! Lucana, one of the most beautiful countries on the Mediterranean coast, and a small peaceful island, Astigos. This morning, the Zagorias Federation, one of the Mediterranean coastal nations, launched a unilateral military offensive against Astigos Island, a territory of the nation of Lucana which has been seeking independence. Despite protests from various nations, the Zagorian forces continue their invasion of Astigos, and sources believe it is only a matter of time before the island is completely occupied. VSSE has learned that the Zagorius army has deployed tactical missiles on Astigos Island that will be a threat not only to Lacana, but to the surrounding nations as well. Two of their best agents were sent in to remove this threat. Alan Dunaway, Wesley Lambert, Jump! Hurry! Alicia Winston. Surprise, surprise. Wild Dog. Allow me to introduce myself. Wild Fang. Get rid of you both. Giorgio Zot. Time Crisis 3. Time Crisis 3. Yes, thank you. You didn't have to repeat the name of the game twice. So yes, this is going to be a single playthrough of the arcade mode of the game. This is going to be on the normal difficulty. And uh, I'm playing on PS2 using the light gun, and we're just going to hop straight into the arcade mode. We're about to be shown the intro to the first stage, and I just want to say strap yourselves in because it's quite an intro. Here they come. Five, maybe? No, I'd say seven. What do you think you're doing here? This is a restricted area! Stop right there! Oh my god! I just love that intro cutscene so much. No matter how many times I see it, I always laugh every time just of how ridiculous and ludicrous it is. Okay, so this is Time Crisis 3, an arcade light gun shooty game. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Time Crisis series, its main gimmick is the fact that you can take cover. The arcade machines would have had a pedal, and when you step on a pedal, you step out of cover and you can shoot the enemies. When you release the pedal, you go back into cover, you're protected from any of the damage from enemy fire, and you reload your gun. A new feature of Time Crisis 3 is the multiple weapon system. While you're taking cover, if you press the fire button, you'll cycle through your four different weapons. You have your bog-standard handgun, the machine gun of rapid fire, the shotgun which fires shots in bursts, and that's good for groups and uh, short close range stuff. And you have the grenade, which is just an explosion that takes out enemies within a certain radius. Um, every weapon except for the handgun has limited ammo, and you can replenish ammo by shooting the enemies in the yellow uniforms. And that's basically the whole game explained. Uh, there's not a whole lot of complexity to Time Crisis 3. All you really need to know is how to point at the screen and shoot things. But that doesn't mean that the game is easy. There's a few factors you have to take into consideration in order to get good at the game. I mean, obviously, you need a good aim. Aiming at the enemies and shooting precisely and quickly is key to completing the levels quickly and getting a high score. But there are some other factors that you need to take into consideration as well. You also need a quick reaction time. Uh, you may have noticed that we are being shot at a lot. There's a lot of enemies on screen and they're all firing at us. But you also notice that they all seem to have gone to the Stormtrooper school of shooting. None of them have particularly good aim and most of the shots they fire off don't hit you. 
but occasionally they will fire off a lethal shot. They will be visible when they flash red on the screen. Any red bullets, uh, and they're the ones that you have to hide from, otherwise if you get hit, you'll lose a life. And you only have four lives and it's game over. So a quick reaction time is key to reacting to those red shots when you see them. You're not given a lot of time when you see the shot before you have to take cover and avoid you know, the bullet before it hits you. And uh, one other major factor to take into consideration when trying to master this game is you basically have to memorize this game off the back of your hand. Uh, it's a fairly linear sequence, so once you memorize where enemies spawn, that'll help you take down the dangerous targets quicker. Seems to be a wrecked ship. Yeah. Uh-oh. Over there! We had three jeeps. Each one had a mounted gun on the back and none of them could hit him. Like I said, the Stormtrooper school of shooting. Action! Haha, a triple headshot. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, yeah, the game does actually score points depending on where you shoot the enemies. If you shoot them in the torso, that gives you more points than if you shoot them in the arm. And you get the most points for shooting them in the head. You get more points if you shoot an enemy multiple times. Like, most of these enemies die in one hit, but if you can shoot them multiple times, up to three times before they're, you know, fully dead, you get more points, and the more hits, you notice that there's sort of a combo counter as you get consecutive hits. And that's a key factor if you want to aim for those high scores, is just to continuously get shots in a sequence without missing. Shotgun. Handgun. So yeah, multiple combos, shooting enemies a lot, and getting accurate shots are key to getting the high scores. Um, the game also scores you quite significantly on time. At the end of each stage section, you get a time bonus depending on how quickly you did the level. And that can be quite a hefty bonus if you're quick. So, you know, you want to be fast, accurate, and shoot things a lot, ideally. And of course, on top of all that, you have to make sure you don't get shot. So you have to make sure to avoid taking damage by reacting to those red shots. Looking at this footage, it does kind of seem like I'm cheating because I know in advance where every enemy is going to appear. That's because I've played this game a lot, trying to master it, and uh, again, a big factor in trying to get good at the game is basically memorization. You have to know where the enemies are going to spawn so you can take them out quickly. <laughs> like sheep to the slaughter. Now there's one other mechanic in this game that I haven't really mentioned, and that's the time mechanic. And you'd think I'd mention that sooner, considering this game is called Time Crisis. But anyway, you notice in the bottom corner there is a timer that ticks down, and uh, basically you have that amount of time to take out the enemies to move on to the next screen. If you take too long killing the enemies and the timer runs out, you end up taking one point of damage. I haven't really mentioned it because it never really feels like an issue. Most of the time I forget there's a timer there. I mean, you know, you seem to have plenty of time to take out the enemies for the most part. It's mostly there just so you don't spend the entire time hiding behind cover like a baby. You're finished. Jump! Hurry! There's no time! Come on! Say goodbye! Alright, time for our first boss fight. It's a guy in a plane, and you're being chased to the jeep. Um, this game does kind of follow a very similar structure to Time Crisis 2. Time Crisis 2 also has the first level end on the chase scene, except instead of being in jeeps, you're on speed points. It's a very similar set piece. The boss is kind of similar as well. I wonder if they like reused assets or something. 
As you can see, I'm making liberal use of the shotgun, which is great for uh, vehicles or enemies that have a health bar that require multiple hits, because of course, you're firing multiple shots every time you fire the shotgun. As well as being good for enemies that require a lot of hits to take down, it's also good for groups and when you just need to be less accurate, because most enemies in this game die in one hit anyway. Uh, so the use of the shotgun in that instance can be helpful if you just want to be quick and non-accurate with it. Like, you don't have to be accurate with the shotgun, you can just fire in that vague direction and you'll usually hit the guy. I think the main drawback to the shotgun is the fact that ammo for it is pretty scarce, at least compared to the machine gun. The machine gun, you can find ammo for that everywhere, like, so long as you get a majority of the yellow guys, I never find I'm hurting for ammo for the machine gun. If you use the shotgun quite a lot, you'll end up running out of shotgun ammo fairly quickly because that's a lot less common. Shotgun. Luckily, in boss fights, they're pretty good with throwing yellow enemies at you, the guys in yellow uniforms who drop ammo. So, in this case, I can use the shotgun a little more uh, liberally than I would otherwise because they give you lots of ammo. Like there, there was a truck full of yellow enemies that just topped up all my ammo. This boss fight isn't actually too hard to be honest, like it's fairly obvious when he's about to attack you and he's not very difficult to hit either, he usually just hangs from his plane and attacks you in perhaps the least effective methods available to him, like why would he have a minigun, why would he aim it at everywhere except you just now, which took off like pretty much all his health, he could have just shot you consistently, he could have just shot the jeep, blown you up. Well, we're nearly done with this boss fight, so let's finish it with a bang! I, I missed completely, the grenade went in between his legs. Okay, that's better. My name is Alicia. I'm with the Lucano Liberation Army. And you two must be... Alan and Wesley from the VSSE. Are you working alone? You're out of your mind. My brother, I mean our men, were captured by the Zagorius army while carrying out a mission to destroy the tactical missiles. I see, so they're using the hostages as bait to force the resistance to surrender, right? Yes, but that will never happen. And so you came all the way by yourself to rescue your brother. Even though quite a few of these cutscenes are kind of silly, I generally avoid trying to skip the cutscenes because they're a good opportunity to take a breather. Playing this game can be pretty intense and, you know, doing it in a continuous run, your arms get tired holding that light gun. The tactical missiles are hidden in the military facility located at the summit of this mountain. We'll need to use the railway on the far side of this town. It's been used for supply transportation and it will be our only route to the facility. We'll meet at the station up ahead! The train leaves at 1500! Don't be late! I have no idea what the tactical advantage of splitting up was, but anyway, here we are! On to stage 2! Nice of the game to let us replenish our ammo after the last boss encounter. And, okay, on we go. You do actually get points for shooting some of the destructible debris in this level. Uh, all the little plates and items on the shopping stalls are all breakable and you can shoot them and you get a paltry amount of points. They also count towards the combo counter, so if you want to maintain your combo they're a good thing, like I'm doing here, to keep the combo counter going up. It doesn't give you a massive score boost, but it's just something else you can do just to keep the combo counter going. There's a Time Crisis spin-off game called Time Crisis Raging Storm. There's an arcade machine of it um, near the beach where I live. And I play it every now and again and it's actually quite a good game, but that's a basically a Time Crisis game where you have a riot shield and machine gun. You play as like some kind of super elite SWAT team soldier man. And um, the entire scoring system of that game is just maintaining a continuous like hit counter. And in order to keep the counter up, you just have to shoot everything 
not just the enemies, like the walls, the items, everything. They put an astronomical amount of effort into creating destructible terrain, which is kind of fun. I still prefer this game though, I think this game is a lot better. I've talked before about arcade games having multiple branching pathways in order to add replayability. This game does not have branching pathways, instead it has two. Two distinct pathways, one for each of the player characters. I'm playing as the player one character, uh, Alan Dunaway, and uh, the player two character is Wesley Lambert. In this case, the player two character is being controlled by a computer who doesn't do anything. They won't take out any enemies for you at all. I have to do all the work because it's a slacker. If you're playing this co-op, you can play together and take out the enemies, uh, and you, you know you'd both have a screen each. In the arcades, you'd have you know two screens on the arcade cabinet. Um, if you have the PS2 version, like I have, you can either play it split screen, which is bloody terrible because the screen just goes to like a quarter size and you can't see anything. Or perhaps the better option is to link up two PlayStation 2 consoles together. And that way you can recreate the arcade experience more accurately. Now from this point on you might see me take cover more often. I think what I find from this point from the game is when the difficulty starts to ramp up significantly. Like, the enemies are much more likely to fire off red shots at random. And the random red shots are the ones you have to look out for. Like, normally, there's quite a few... Uh, yeah, like there. There's quite a few red shots that are scripted, like with the red guys and certain other enemies that will, are guaranteed to fire off a lethal shot. But from here, there's quite a few random ones, and they're the ones you can never really be quite prepared for, and that's the ones you have to rely on your quick reaction time to deal with. I'm just going to hide behind here, because that guy always seems to fire off a red shot. And now we can go back to taking care of these bikes, who again, are quite uh, uh, trigger happy when it comes to lethal shots. Sure, we're heading the right way. Actually, I was just following you. What? Well, I guess we came to the right place. <laughs> These two guys, Alan and Wesley, they're such twats. I'm sorry. They're like, they act like massive twats throughout the entire game. They just spend the entire time just wisecracking and, you know, making jokes. And it seems like as the Time Crisis series goes on, the protagonists have gotten progressively more and more douchey. Time Crisis 1, the protagonist was just a very generic, boring man in a leather jacket. He didn't really have a personality. In Time Crisis 2, they still didn't really have personalities, but they were sort of refined and sort of differentiated from each other, the two protagonists. And in Time Crisis 3, we have a guy who always has aviator sunglasses on his head and a guy with like 90s Leonardo DiCaprio haircut. I mean, that intro cutscene where they're on the boat and they blow up the guys with the bomb just kind of set the tone for how silly these guys are. And it's only gotten worse. Just look at the protagonist- Google the protagonist of Time Crisis 5 and tell me you don't want to punch them in the face. I mean, one of them's wearing a baseball cap and a basketball jersey. Who does that? Another thing to keep in mind when playing this game is prioritising which enemy to take out first. There are lots of different enemy types in this game and they all have various different threat levels towards you. Uh, the most common enemy is the guys in the green uniforms. They're usually not a huge issue. They die in one hit, so they're just the basic grunts. The guys in the red uniforms are usually the ones you want to take out first. They are the most accurate and they will most likely fire off a red shot the moment they see you, so you want to take them out first before they get off that red shot. The armoured orange guys with the machine guns, they take multiple hits. Um, and they're not as accurate as the red guys, but they're still pretty dangerous. They'll still have a fairly decent chance of getting a good shot off at you. So generally, the if you want to play it safe with the machine gun guy, just hide behind cover entirely whilst they're shooting with the machine gun, because they have to stop and reload, and it's fairly easy to tell when they stop shooting. It's perhaps not the most optimum solution to hide behind cover the entire time they're shooting their machine gun at you because whilst you're hiding behind cover, you are essentially wasting time 
And of course, at the end of the, each stage, you're given a time bonus, so your score would be lower. But, uh, you know, when you're doing a no damage run, you want to make sure you don't take any chances. So, it's often a good idea to play it safe. At least that's what I find. A few enemy types I haven't mentioned. Uh, the guys in the u blue uniforms have varying types of weapons of different threat levels. Some of them are more effective than others. There's quite a few of them carry rocket launchers. They're pretty accurate. They'll fire a red rocket at you. But the thing is, rockets are slower projectiles, so they're actually easier to dodge and react to. So they're not quite as dangerous as they seem, although naturally you have this Pavlovian reaction whenever you see a red flash on the screen. You, know, you immediately hide from that because it's terrifying and you know you're going to get hit. Um, the other blue guy weapon is a throwing axe. They don't flash red, but you can hear it coming, and that's a threat you have to listen out for. They're a fairly slow projectile too, so again, you're given plenty of time to react to it, even when, due to the fact you don't see the red flash. You just have to know when they've thrown it and listen for the audio cue. Uh, some of the blue guys have a decent amount of health, the flamethrower guys, and uh, they're a special case. They're essentially close range fighters. You don't have to worry about them too much, they only appear a few times in the game. But they're still pretty deadly if you're not expecting them. Alicia, she didn't make it. You sure about that? Alan! Wesley! Come on, hurry! I've got to say, this girl gets a lot of leg shots. <laughs> Alright, so we're at the end of level 2, and uh, we're in the boss encounter. Again, like Time Crisis 2, the end of the second stage ends on a train. So again, I wonder if they were just working with a similar kind of blueprint with this game. It's not a bad set piece, definitely. I just, I just something I noticed when I was playing it. I was like, hang on a minute, I've done this before. Back in the day, when I had a PS2, you know, in the PS2 heyday, I did have Time Crisis 2, but I never had Time Crisis 3. Uh, I picked up Time Crisis 3 now with the Slimline PS2 again because it was cheap. Uh, my old PS2 I got rid of ages ago because they kept breaking. In my experience, PS2 tended to have this terrible build quality about them. I don't know what it was, but all the PS2s I had all kept getting disc read errors. I don't know if that was like a big common thing, but I don't know, I could never get mines to last very long. So it wasn't long before we just ditched it entirely. Um, but yeah, this is the first time I've had the home console version of Time Crisis 3. So I get to enjoy the extra rescue mission content they added to the home version where you play through the main game from the perspective of Alicia Winston. And it's bloody difficult, but it's quite fun. I did play Time Crisis 3 quite a few times in the arcade. In fact, uh, I played it in the arcade quite recently. Uh, a couple of years ago, I found a Time Crisis 3 arcade machine in Fun World in London. Uh, Fun World now is basically what is the remnants of what was Sega World back in the day. Uh, back in the 90s in London, the Chocodero Centre housed this massive arcade place called Sega World, and that was crazy fun. I went there as a kid. I don't remember much of it, I just remember having a blast there because it was Sega World and it was crazy. But at some point, I guess, you know, once Sega died, it turned into a smaller arcade called Fun World in the Trocadero Center. And I guess in the past few years, that sort of got progressively smaller and smaller. And now the Trocadero Center doesn't have anything in it. All there is in there, last time I went, which was a couple of years ago, were a few, like, London tourist shops and some terrible... I don't know, small stores that sell counterfeit like weeaboo shit. Um, but Fun World still does sort of exist in the basement somewhere. I'm not even joking, it's a literal like in the, near the underground station. 
and uh, it's a, just basically a small area, but it still has a few arcade machines in there, and among them is an old Time Crisis 3 machine, and I managed to play that again, and that was quite fun. I just realised I've been blasting through this entire boss fight without saying a word about him. Although the fight itself is fairly self-explanatory though, so he didn't miss much. I don't know what this guy's deal is though, aside from his emo haircut. Maybe he's gay. Alan! Wesley! Alicia! Are you alright? Yeah, I'm fine. But... I guess we're on foot from here. your brother? The rebels are still refusing to surrender. Maybe your death will teach them a lesson. It won't do you any good. <laughs> don't worry. If they don't surrender, I have another option in mind. Daniel! Wait! We'll take care of the enemy troops. You go and rescue your brother, okay? Ready to make some noise? Oh yeah! Can you imagine these two twats in bed? Ready to make some noise? Oh yeah! Okay, so we're on to the third and final level of the game, and uh, as expected this is the most difficult one. Uh, lots of these enemies fire off red shots at seemingly random. I mean, there's quite a few scripted ones as well, there's quite a few red guys who will fire off a shot. Um, but there's also, they seem much more likely to fire off those random red shots, which is the ones you need to react to. That's why they're quite difficult. That yellow guy who just came out the door is, he's guaranteed to fire off a red shot, even though he's not the red guy. Like, they seem like there's certain instances where they're scripted to fire off a lethal shot at all times. Just like in real life, a tank, which probably costs millions of dollars, can be taken out in a few shotgun shells. Just like in real life. I'm not really giving these enemies much of a time to shine. Uh, I, I said, yeah, they are more likely to fire off red shots, but I'm killing them pretty much as soon as they appear, and in my mind that seems to be the best way of playing the game. You've got to kill them before they have a chance of even shooting you at all. This is the normal difficulty. Uh, it does go up to hard and very hard, and the uh, different difficulty levels basically just determine how often you get the random deadly red shots, I think. I think that's pretty much the only change. Notice none of these guys fired off a red shot, but I still sort of make a habit of hiding there, because in my experience, they're very likely to fire off a shot. Yeah, like there. It's just a good idea to just play it safe and hide behind cover if you're trying to avoid damage. Surprise, surprise! Wild dog, don't you ever die? <laughs> oh, what the? Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Wild Fang, and it's a pleasure to meet you! Oh, snap! It's the boss fight with Wild Dog, Time Crisis's long running antagonist man who's been in every game. And now he has a new apprentice called Wild Fang, or as I like to call him, Scrappy Doo, because you know he's their dogs or something. I don't know. So um, Wild Dog's gimmick is that he has a gun on his arm, um, and Wild Fang's gimmick is that he has super-powered kicks and can kick objects at you. Shotgun. It's quite a fun boss fight. It's entirely scripted, so once you figure out where they're spawning from and how the sequence works out, it's not too hard. And the shotgun at close range makes really quick work of them. So, if you want to take these guys out quickly, just use a shotgun, because it only takes like one or two shots. Handgun. I should mention that I'm using a light gun, but it's not the Gun Con 2 that Time Crisis 3 normally is used with, because that gun only works with the CRT television, and I don't have a CRT TV. 
Instead, I'm using the Aimtrack PC light gun. It's a light gun that essentially works the same way as a Wii remote does. It sort of uses a sensor bar to detect where it's pointing on the screen. And it's designed for use on the PC. It works as a USB mouse, basically. But for some reason, it it has compatibility with the PS2, kind of? I'm, I'm surprised it does, and it's not exactly the best compatibility. I mean, it only works with a select few games, including Time Crisis 2 and 3. Um, it also has a few finicky problems, like you have to reset the PS2 a few times for it to get it working, I find. And it has the same problems that using a Wiimote has when using a pointer, like where you're pointing is dependent on where you're sitting in a room. And it gets a lot of interference from other sources of infrared light, or any natural light at all, really. But if you don't have a CRT TV, it's a fine alternative, I suppose. Wild Fang would eventually continue on to be a long-running antagonist of the series, along with Wild Dog. Uh, although in this game he just kind of shows up with, without any real explanation or anything. In fact, Wild Dog just kind of shows up as well. They don't really... they just kind of show up. They're not established early in the game at all. I mean, you're, you're just kind of minding your own business, and then it's just like, surprise, surprise, and then there you are. There's, there's Wild Dog, and here's a new character, Wild Fang, that's it. There's very little story in this game as it is, and these two characters, who are the main antagonists of the entire series, contribute nothing to the story. I'm not saying I'm expecting, you know, quality writing in Time Crisis, I'm just saying it's kind of funny. They just kind of show up, just because it's sort of an obligation at this point for Wild Dog to show up in a Time Crisis game. Oh, beaten by a couple of young... A little low on that time bonus this time, but I was playing a bit more conservatively. Hold it right there. Looking for him. Drop your weapons. <laughs> Stop! Alicia, we're going after him. Take care of your brother. I do want to mention something I really like about this game, and it's the fact that there are so many different animations for enemies getting shot. I mean, I guess it makes sense considering that's what you're doing the entire game, but I think it's a really nice attention to detail that they react in so many different ways depending on the way you shoot them. I mean, they shoot... They, they, yeah, they react differently to where you shoot them on the body, but they also react to which direction they're being shot at. Like, if you shoot them from the side, it's different from if you shoot them from behind or from the front. There are so many different animations, and it really looks and feels good when you shoot an enemy, especially if you shoot a single enemy multiple times, and you can see all the different animations that play. I think it looks a lot better than if they just used ragdolls or something. So this area is actually pretty difficult. Of course, it's the near enough the finale of the game, and everything's on fire, which basically obscures a lot of the enemies, makes them harder to see, and the fact that everything's basked in this orange glow means it's hard to tell what colour the enemies are at a glance. So that can kind of throw you off a bit. I do kind of like also that this is a tiny room with only two doors, and both of the doors were closed, and there were so many enemies popping up from behind the tables and everything, like, it makes no sense, it's like a clown car. All the enemies were just hiding behind these tiny tables and desks the entire time. So this is a part that's really difficult to pull off flawlessly, because there's a lot of enemies. It's also just a really long screen, like, normally when you beat a bunch of enemies you move on to a screen and the time resets, and this time it's just a screen you're on for ages, and the time doesn't reset until you take out a lot of enemies. So not only do you have to deal with these super aggressive enemies that fire off a lot of red shots, you have to do it very quickly. This is like the one part of the game but the time limit seems to be a real issue for me, like I, I have a genuine time crisis here. And to top it off, the final enemy fires off a red shot like the moment you kill one enemy, so you have to be prepared for that guy. Another challenge here is that 
the enemies on these balconies are really far away and they actually make good use of the cover like only their heads are poking out so you have to be pretty accurate to hit those guys who are really far away on those balconies. But now we're past that screen I think it gets easier from here. Uh, I think we're past the worst of it. I'm just going to take care of these enemies and uh, we should be home free for the next area. Although I hate this flamethrower guy so I'm just going to use a grenade on him. And I really can't bother to deal with all these people, so grenade! are all targeted for Lucado and ready for launch. What? I should have gotten rid of that pesky country a long time ago. <laughs> and now, time to get rid of you both. So here we are in the final boss fight with the rather unfortunately named Giorgio Zot, who now wants to blow up a country for some reason. The key to this fight is basically memorizing how Giorgio Zot works, and also... Oh no! My no damage run ruined! I was actually aiming for a single credit clear, like, without getting any continues, and I got to this point point, I was like, oh shit, I might actually do an actual no damage run, and then I got hit. So, that, so that, that teaches me for jinxing it. But as you can see, the enemies here are even more aggressive, which I guess is appropriate for the final confrontation of the game. Um, you have to deal with Giorgio, who has a sword and a machine gun and has ninja powers, I guess, because he kind of teleports everywhere. And uh, yeah, you just have to be quick and shoot all the enemies and be able to react to the vast number of shots that are being shot at you. Naturally, just memorizing where Giorgio spawns and where he runs to is probably the best way of avoiding damage. Machine gun. Lucky for me, Giorgio doesn't seem very smart because even though he has teleporting powers, he doesn't figure out that he can just go ab around the cover to hit me rather than just swing at the air while I was standing. When things get dicey, don't be afraid to just use the grenade, which is basically the fuck it button. So yeah, um, I'm basically I'm a really big fan of these old arcade light gun style games, these rail shooters. I think there's something to be said about a game that's essentially just very short and linear, but can still sort of bring you back for more in order to perfect your scores and get better at the game. I think even though there's not a whole lot of content here in these arcade games, because they are very short and basic, I think what content there is here is very well done, very well polished. This entire experience is almost like a movie. It's, I mentioned this with Star Fox, it's a singular experience that you play and uh, you know, in more or less one sitting. And each time you do it you see if you can beat your personal scores and see if you can do better. And there's so many different ways to play this particular game as well. I mean I've just challenged myself to do a single credit clear run of this game. But I could also go back and play it using only the handgun. I could self-impose challenge of myself. Or I can do the same thing but with the other route playing as uh, Wesley, player 2 character. Again, not a very long game by any means, but it gets you plenty of replay value and incentive to go back for more. And there's some unlockables you can get in the home console version as well, I suppose. I mean, the Wii had quite a few sort of modern light gun games like the Resident Evil Dark Side Chronicles, and there's House of the Overkill, which I really like. It's a fun game. But it's not a very arcadey game, it's sort of slow and long and doesn't really have that same kind of fast intense action that I crave in these kind of arcade action games. Anyway, we're nearly done with this boss fight. Oh. Okay, that was my fault, I got hit by myself. Let's finish this with a bang! 
Let's finish this with a bang. Let's finish the handgun. Can't believe I missed those last two grenades. You know, fine, I'll use the handgun. up to them. Yeah, they'll be fine. Yep, trying to rebuild their destabilized country is their problem now. It's not our job. As agents of the VSSE, Adam and Wesley will ride off into the sunset and be gay or something. I don't know. And that's it for Time Crisis 3. As you can see, I got a new high score. Pretty good, huh? I'm actually more impressed that I managed to do it in a single credit clear, which is what I was aiming for. Managed to do it without dying once. Although I got pretty close towards the end. Aside from those few hiccups, I think I did pretty good. And because I completed it without dying, I got some bonus arcade options. And it's a new record in terms of score and is a new record in terms of time as well, which is pretty good. So, I hope you enjoyed watching me play Time Crisis 3. See you guys next time, Crisis. Next time, Crisis.